children, the human raw material of each shattered nation's tomorrow. Each nation's preview in flesh and blood of its future. Pillars of the brave new world. Pillars of the brave new world. Ages from three to six and not even able to stand. Ricketts. Age nine. Mother tortured, father burned alive. Age 10, lost her senses when shells swept her Dutch village. Age 8, mother, father, sister and brother killed all around him in deliberate shell fire because they refused to leave the shelter of a ravine. Himself wounded. Age 8, she didn't know her strange new toy was a grenade. Ages 10 to 14. Age 3. Stunted and warped by nutritional deficiencies. Pillars of the brave new world. Separated from parents whose names they don't even remember. Roaming like wolf packs, stealing, begging, education neglected, all normal influence gone, living in filth, and millions more like them, from which will emerge new leaders, new leaders who also will bear the burden of keeping the peace together, for here too, as well as in more fortunate nations, are makers of tomorrow. Will they be new Einsteins, Toscaninis, Manuel Quezons, Madame Curies, Sun Yat-sens, or new Hitlers, Mussolinis, Tojos? For the Axis had carefully contrived a legacy a legacy designed to drag down neighbor nations and their future into one common ruin, jeopardizing the next generation for the next round. For Germany in particular, it had long practice at ripping the entire fabric of a nation's life so that a state of enduring weakness could be assured, liberation or not. Liberated Lidice. The Czech village that once filled this entire valley and then was wiped so completely off the face of the earth that not even rubble remained. For all the women were sent to concentration camps of which these are among the surviving few. For all the men and boys of the village were shot and buried in one common grave. and all the little children sold for 50 marks apiece to various German families, and perhaps lost forever. The effects of which will linger long after men like these, captured SS men who helped destroy Lidice, have been tried and condemned. And their big shot counterparts who created in a greater degree a design for destruction that made Lidice an ominous miniature of the design willed to all of civilization. A design detailed by Hitler himself in the last days of the Third Reich, as he stated in essence, We shall leave an inheritance of ruin, stone heaps, red epidemic, hunger and death, and thereby Western civilization shall decline. Rebirth through ruins. Twisting whole countries into economic cripples. Weakness that will last for decades. Re 
rebirth through stone heaps. Reducing human living to animal level. Rebirth through rats, epidemics. Nothing reduces population like plague. Rebirth through hunger. A starved nation cannot be a sturdy one, and malnutrition leaves a lingering mark. Rebirth through death. Reducing and withering the mass population of all countries within reach so that the Germans and Japanese would remain the strongest physically and mentally, come what may. And thereby, civilization shall decline. Nor was this final strategy of rebirth through common ruin something special born of Adolf Hitler only. The German general staff, like the Jap general staff, were old hands at it. These were the words of General von Rundstedt talking before the Berlin Military Academy at war's outset. We Germans must number twice the population of our neighbors. Therefore, we shall be compelled to destroy one-third of the population of all adjacent territories. We can best achieve this through systematic malnutrition, in the end far superior to machine guns. Starvation works more effectively, especially among the young. Starvation works more effectively, especially among the young. Unquestionably, of all the victims in the program against whole populations, the most pitiful have been the most precious, the young. Even after liberation, the heirs to the Axis legacy of fear, hunger, and hate, to be nourished in an atmosphere of desperation for a destiny of despair, calculated to supply the new tools the new Hitlers, Tojos, and Mussolinis of an even bloodier tomorrow. But with the lesson of two world wars to learn from, if any of us among the United Nations give fascism its cunningly planned open road to revival by being fooled into neglecting this, or this, the Axis legacy in action as the true cost in terms of tomorrow begins to show itself, dissension. Distress, despair, doubt, defeatism, fertile soil for the seeds of World War III, and significant signs of Axis success in this, the last battle. And if we permit this to be the face of the future, then truly there will be only one place in which to rest the full burden of blame, on ourselves. Ourselves including those of us strolling in the shaded streets of nations whose trees have not been stripped by shrapnel, and whose homes have suffered neither burn nor blast, on lush land bearing no scar of a scorched earth, 
in the shops where shortage represents not death, but merely temporary discomfort. Walking by schools and grounds where the only screams that have been heard were and are those of children at play, and whose steeples stretch toward God unshadowed by the bomber's wing. In this atmosphere, the imagination, no matter how vivid, cannot convey the full meaning of what others have endured and still endure. But to those homes wherein the fateful telegrams have been delivered, and the blue stars have given way to gold, has come the evidence that geography is no bar to tragedy. Just as to all homes has been given the warning that people who do not understand history are doomed to repeat it. To many men and nations has come the conviction that the world simply cannot survive another war. Thus, even as they meet in the hope of ending war forever, the United Nations look to the first organization created in their name, UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. UNRWA, much criticized and much praised, but still the only major source through which the United Nations pump into the veins and arteries of stricken peoples around the earth the emergency items of relief and rehabilitation that serve as the plasma of peace. Items from six continents and seven seas. <laughs> An outpouring from each nation's heart to each war-stricken friend and neighbor. Hundreds of private relief and welfare organizations blend their efforts through UNRWA along with the contributions of the governments themselves. As all over the ravaged areas, the tired heart of liberated nations fights to regain strength and vigor. and the strong heart of the United Nations working hand in hand to help. A welfare specialist from Australia, a doctor from Cuba and a nurse from Belgium, a child expert from England, a therapeutist from Ohio, from Canada, Norway, South Africa, China, operating despite the handicaps of varied languages and learning constructive new lessons in international teamwork for it very wisely has been said that the nations will learn to work together only by actually working together. And by providing treatment at artificial limbs for the crippled and disabled. And teaching occupations that will enable the men to stand on their own feet again, even though the feet themselves be artificial. And with donated shoes, learning to be shoemakers so that they may later serve their own villages. And so the pulse of rehabilitation begins to beat again in the areas warped and withered by war. It is a pulse that beats feebly at first, this pulse of restoration, while little men labor and strive with whatever is at hand or can be brought to hand. And the mounds of supplies seen in the docks and in the warehouses melt down into inadequate, minute portions. Carefully measured out so that all may share and survive and work. And homes are remade wherever a roof is to be found that will provide shelter. Part of a glider wing helps repair one house. Discarded gun covers keep the elements out of another. So also on the farm is restoration sought, despite the toll exacted daily by war's lethal leftovers. For the food supply itself is a matter of life and death. And wherever and whenever fuel can be obtained, the smoke rises once more from family stoves and firesides. 
the return to normalcy takes on many forms, even though it be a nightmare kind of normalcy. UNRWA is able to report progress, but small in comparison to need. For each nail driven, a hundred thousand more are needed. For each blanket given, a thousand more must be given. And the same with plows, and seed, and trucks, and medicine, and clothes, and livestock, and vitamins and food to turn rickety bodies into rugged bodies, and turn prostrated populations once more into proud and prolific peoples and all the other hundreds of items, straining and exhausting, straining and exhausting, an initial UNRWA budget of two billion dollars, made up of one percent of each contributing nation's annual income, two billion dollars, less than the cost of five days of war, five days of war, without shadows or pain, or lost arms, legs, minds. Five days without a single soldier having to give his life. The cut rate price of peace. A peace purchased at a much higher price by men in whose hearts echoed the words of Thomas Paine. If there be trouble, let it be in my time that my child may have peace. Peace, too, for those children already maimed in one war who must never experience or symbolize another. What seeds of destiny will sprout from within these ravaged ranks and lands where the specter of famine stalks? New Führers, or new lovers of liberty? The answer? It will hang in the balance throughout the immediate months and years, for there's still a long way to go in this last battle. A long way. While men of goodwill everywhere face the challenge to shape a world in which each nation's upcoming generation can walk with hope and confidence the paths of peace and strive to meet the responsibilities and preserve the victories won by fighting men of the United Nations the hard way. And establish once and for all that even stronger than the atomic bomb is the human heart. <laughs>